now we come to the final unit on antennas and transmission lines. So as we had talked about earlier, uh, an alternating current will always produce an electromagnetic field. But we don't radiate all the power in our power lines away because our power lines are very inefficient radiators at 60 hertz. So let's turn to the simplest efficient antenna, which is the dipole antenna. This consists of two conducting rods, each of a quarter of a wavelength uh, in length. So for example, if we're on the 10 meter band, then half a wavelength is five meters and a quarter wavelength is two and a half meters. So these two rods you see here would be two and a half meters each. Now they're being fed by some voltage and at the center point of the antenna, the voltage and current are in phase. So the antenna looks to the source of a signal like a resistor. And what you can see is as the electric uh, field applied is changing, so the current flows into and out of each of the elements. And the current is a maximum at the center of the antenna and it generates a voltage that goes from zero or very small at the middle of the antenna to maximum at the end of the antennas. And so the electric polarization then is generated in the line of the antenna. The result is that a time varying electric field shown by these green arrows propagates outward from the antenna. And in this case, we're not showing the magnetic field, it would lie perpendicular to that um, electric field. So the antenna then is an efficient radiator of energy. How efficient? Well, it turns out that if you calculate the effective resistance of this dipole antenna, and how do you do that? Well, by working out for a given voltage and frequency at resonance, in other words, when the antenna is half a wavelength total length, two quarter wavelengths, a uh, quarter wavelength in each element, you calculate the radiated power and then from the voltage and the power derive a resistance, it comes out to be about 72 ohms. Now for real antennas, it's less than this because there's coupling to lossy things like the ground and so on. And so 50 ohms is actually a very uh, common likely resistance for a dipole antenna. Now notice that the propagation direction um, is perpendicular, of course, to the uh, electric polarization direction. And this means that the power from a dipole antenna is not uniformly radiated. If you looked along the ends of the antenna, at least far from the antenna, you would see no signal. If you look perpendicular to the antenna, you would see maximum signal. So in this sense, the uh, power that radiates from a dipole antenna is focused. And uh, it gives, therefore, relative to a uniform distribution of radiation, it gives a gain of about 1.6 times, which corresponds to about two decibels uh, relative to a uniform spreading of this radiation into space. Now, this radiation resistance of the antenna is critical because if you have a source of this potential difference applied to the antenna that has an internal resistance exactly equal to this 50 ohms, then essentially all of the incident electrical energy is radiated as electromagnetic waves. So these are the conditions for making an efficient antenna. Okay, so now we have an efficient antenna showed on the right as a multiband ham radio antenna. And we have an efficient transmitter shown on the left how do we connect one to the other? And we want to do it in a way that doesn't cause a loss of energy through radiation from the connection. The way this is done is a transmission line. And a transmission line is essentially a pair of conductors in which the current moves in a given any given time up one conductor and back down the opposing conductor. 
So the electric and magnetic fields from one conductor are exactly cancelled by the electric and magnetic fields from the other conductor, and the pair of conductors does not radiate. On the top, you see a pair of parallel wires. This is a transmission line called a ladder line. And on the bottom, you see a coaxial cable in which a cylindrical shield uh, surrounds a central um, conductor. The ZS and ZL here represent the so-called source and load impedance. The load impedance, of course, is the radiation resistance of the antenna, looking like a 50 ohm resistor. So as you might guess, we then want 50 ohm cable and a transmitter with a 50 ohm output to get the most efficient transfer of energy from the transmitter to the antenna. Let's make this a little more quantitative. So I want to introduce you to a very uh, useful theory in circuit theory, which is the Thevenin model. Now, these blue boxes here are supposed to be exactly that. They are mystery boxes with two terminals on them. And I'm giving them to you in the lab, and I'm asking you to characterize them. Now, for the time being, we're going to assume that we're only working with DC voltages, and so that all you can measure are currents and voltages. So you take your meter, your meter with the high internal resistance that doesn't present a load to anything, and you stick it across the two terminals, as in here. And then what you measure is a voltage V1. That is the voltage of this black box at no load, and that is defined to be the Thevenin voltage. Now you repeat the experiment, but you load the box with a resistor, which I've called R2. You then take your meter and you measure the voltage across the terminals again. And in general, you'll measure a different voltage. Why? Because inside the black box, someone have, may have placed a resistor in series of the battery that generated the Thevenin voltage. You don't know that, of course, it may be more complicated than a resistor, but that's the simplest thing you can say that there is a maybe a resistor in series with it. And if there is, when you draw a current from here, you'll have a voltage drop across this resistor. And so the voltage now across this second resistor will be less than V1. So what's the current flowing through this resistor you strapped across the box? It's V2 divided by R2 from Ohm's law, V2 over R2. But this current must be the same as the current flowing through this mystery resistor. And how much is that? Well, it's the voltage across the mystery resistor, V1 minus V2, divided by its value, R1. So if you rearrange this equation for R1, you'll see that R1 is R2 times the voltage difference, V1 minus V2, divided by V2. So this is the way that you can measure the so-called internal resistance of a voltage source. And if you do a little bit of math, you can show that the maximum power transfer occurs when R1 equals R2. So that when R2, for example, is um, zero, then there's no power dissipation in the load because the load has no resistance. When the resistance is very high, the current is uh, very small, and so there's no power dissipation. But when R2 is just equal to R1, there is a maximum transfer of power from this blue box to the load resistor. So to summarize, what the Thevenin theorem tells us is that when the source resistance of some source of electrical power equals the load resistance, then the transfer of power is a maximum. Now, in radio circuits, of course, we have AC waveforms which change uh, with time and it, for which the phase can be changed by reactive components. There we replace R with Z, the so-called impedance, which is a complex number that represents the resistance and the reactance. Um, but we'll use the word impedance in the most general sense. We don't have to worry about reactance in the case of the antenna because we know it looks like a resistor of 50 ohms. And therefore we want our transmission line to look like a resistor of 50 ohms. And we want our power source to look like a resistor of 50 ohms. So it turns out that the characteristic impedance of a uh, transmission line is relatively simple to calculate. 
So here is the math. And so for a coaxial cable of the right dimension, so there's a picture of the coaxial cable on the left, but it's very easy to get coaxial cables in which the ratio of the outer diameter to the inner diameter, big D to little d, is such that the uh, characteristic impedance is resistive and 50 ohms. Another type of line is one in which the two wires just lie parallel to one another. That's called ladder line, shown down below, where the black chunks in the middle are just plastic spaces. And it has a similar formula for the resistance. Um, and the result of that calculation is that typical dimensions like the ones you see here give a characteristic impedance of 400 ohms, which is more than you want. Um, but uh, you'll see that that's not actually the world's worst problem. So what happens when you have a mismatched source of power and um, load? In other words, what happens if the transmission line is not matched to the load? Well, on the left in the little red line, you see a pulse of energy coming down, hitting the point where the impedance of the load no longer matches that of the transmission line. And you'll see that the pulse is reduced in intensity passing uh, into the load. And some of the power is reflected with a change in sign of the uh, polarization of the wave. Now, of course, what happens is a radio wave is a continuous series of such pulses. And so when these reflected pulses hit the incident pulses, at some places they reinforce them, causing the amplitude to double, and at other places they destructively interfere, causing the amplitude to go to zero. So the top picture is a simulation of standing waves on a transmission line where the different colors are different times, um, showing you how the amplitude varies with distance at a given time on the transmission line. Now, the reflection coefficient um, for a uh, transmission line impedance of ZL and a load impedance of Z0, or sorry, a load impedance of ZL and a transmission uh, line impedance of Z0 is given by ZL minus C0 over ZL plus C0. So when ZL equals C0, the reflection coefficient is one and uh, or zero rather so no power is reflected and that means therefore the reflected power p sub r in this equation here is zero this here is an expression for the so-called standing wave ratio which is essentially the uh, largest amplitude of the standing wave on the translation uh, mission line to the smallest amplitude and it's given by one plus the square root of power reflected versus the forward power over one minus the power, square root of the power reflected divided by the forward power. So if the reflected power is zero, you have a perfect match 50 ohm line and a 50 ohm antenna, um, PR is zero, and the standing wave ratio is one over one or just one. And that's what you want to aim for is a standing wave ratio of one. And this ratio is often measured by a meter on your transmitter or a meter that you can interpose between the transmitter uh, transmitter and the um, and the antenna. Now, actually, it's a mistake to believe that the standing wave ratio has to be exactly one. Uh, it turns out quite a large standing wave ratio can be tolerated. Why? Well, because this reflected power will go back to the transmitter and be reflected back out again. And eventually, after enough passes, it will leak out of the antenna. But the higher the reflection ratio at the mismatched interface, uh, the more the number of passes and the higher the amplitude of the standing wave. And what this means is that the voltage on the transmission line or even at the output of the transmitter can become excessive. So you could damage the components in your transmitter or you could break down the dielectric in your transmission line by excessive voltage. And at the same time, the large number of pulses through the transmission line will cost you energy if the transmission line is lossy. Now, this actually is where that 400 ohm ladder line comes in. Although it doesn't match the impedance of a dipole uh, very well at all, 
it's a difference between 450 so that's quite a large that's 350 in the denominator of this or the numerator of this ratio for gamma the reflection coefficient so it's big um, but uh, it doesn't matter too much because the ladder line has a very low intrinsic loss and it can tolerate a large number of passes of power so ladder line is indeed often used to couple to dipole antennas and actually with clever matching one can make the dipole antenna appear to be 400 ohms to a 400 ohm ladder line. So it's not necessarily a problem, but in general, you want to aim for a standing wave ratio of unity. Another issue to consider when using coaxial cable is that coaxial cable is inherently unbalanced. It's not symmetrical. And this means that the um, current of the electric fields and magnetic fields of the outer conductor do not precisely balance the electric fields and magnetic fields of the inner conductor. So when one matches to something symmetrical, like a dipole antenna, it's uh, typical to use a transformer that takes an unbalanced input, as shown here, uh, to a balanced input. So this might be a few turns of wire wound around a ferrite core with a few turns on the other side connected to the antenna. Actually, for most purposes, the simplest thing to do is to use a so-called balance choke. And the way this works is that it is the return current through the um, coaxial cable outer sheath uh, net current um, that is the problem. So if you turn the coaxial cable into a giant inductor, it will oppose the passage of this net AC current owing to the imbalance of the coaxial cable with the result that more current is passed onto the antenna. And so if you look up at the uh, antenna at W7ASU, you'll see a choke very much like this that I built for the club. OK, when I was a pirate radio station operator in my far distant youth, um, I didn't know anything about antennas and just strung uh, a long wire from my house to the bottom of the garden. So the, and the uh, reactance of this antenna was something unknown. Well, it turns out you can match random wires. In fact, you can make almost anything radiate. There's actually a, a hobby out of seeing how far you can get by putting your power into an electric light bulb. How do you match some arbitrary thing to a transmitter? And the answer is using um, a combination of inductors and resistors to cancel the reactive components of the crazy antenna and make it look like a resistor to the transmitter. Um, one way of doing this is the so-called L-section match, which consists of an inductor and a capacitor, and they are arrayed differently according to whether the source resistance is lower than the load resistance or higher than the load resistance. A general version of these L-sections is sort of two L sections in series or a pi section. And you can see that the two capacitors and the inductors form the letter pi. And then with the right range of values for C1, C2 and L, you can match just about anything. And so on the right here, you see a homemade pi match system for a ham radio transmitter with two variable capacitors. Those plates slide in and out to change the capacitors capacitance here are the two variable capacitors and um, then this switch here lets you choose the amount of the inductance and indeed a device like this will tune almost anything and allow you to radiate efficiently. Um, a, an improvement on the dipole if you want to focus more power in a given direction is so-called Yagi antenna. Uh, this is an antenna designed um, so that the parasitic elements as they're called so here's the driven element the dipole and then behind it is a reflector and in front of it is a director they're called the parasitic elements because electric fields induce currents in them which in turn cause radiation that interferes with the radiation from the primary driven element and by arranging the spacing just right you can force power to go in the forward direction towards the director the left shows a um, horizontally polarized Yagi antenna, and the right shows a vertically polarized Yagi antenna. 
Um, horizontal polarization is pretty universal across most ham radio bands where you can use a Yagi, obviously at 160 meters wavelength, an 80 wave meter wavelength dipole uh, would be pretty impractical for most people uh, to put up in a Yagi antenna. So typically a wire antenna is used down there, but for all of the higher frequency bands, and indeed for our club antenna, we start as low as seven megahertz in our Yagi. Um, one uses horizontal polarization and a multi-element beam. Um, vertical polarization is typically used for FM communication on, for example, the 430 megahertz band. So I want to uh, end with here an array of Yagis, and this shows the Yagis at my house. You saw this before when I showed my uh, QSL card. It's an array of four 12 element Yagis, and they are designed for 144 megahertz, and they are fed by cables of such a length that they all operate in phase and interfere with one another to generate a very strongly forward uh, powered beam. So strong is this that if the moon is on the horizon and my antennas are pointed towards Phoenix, I will pick up a tremendous noise. But as soon as the moon goes a few degrees above the horizon, these antennas are so sharp that then the only noise they hear comes from the background noise from outer space. And so my moon bounce system doesn't work well when the moon happens to be um, in the direction of the black hole at the center of our galaxy, because that is a huge source of radio noise and it's impossible to do moon bounce communication. But when the moon is in front of a quiet part of our galaxy uh, and the moon is high enough that I don't pick up noise from Phoenix, uh, it is quite amazing what you can hear. So. There you are, you've had a summary of a lot of the technical aspects and the fun aspects of ham radio and heard a little bit about what I do. So I hope you get your licenses so you can do what you want to do.